Welcome to another episode of uh, Moments with Nyengeterai. Thank you so much for tuning in and for becoming a part of this community and especially for coming back to learn, to 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 just um, engage with us. I, I love the comments. Thank you. Continue to send the comments. Then continue to subscribe, continue to share. Um, I really thank you for being a part of this uh, community that is growing. So today I have another interesting gift. Um, I was asking her before we went on camera, to, are you Diane or Diana? Because, you know, some people want to be called Diana, or Di but then she said. <laughs> <laughs> it's Diana, but Diane is okay. What's not okay is all that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. So, you know, I mean, a lot of people who know you, know you as uh, an art, someone who's in the arts industry. So talk to me about who Diana is. Okay, so I'm um, I'm currently uh, going by the tech talent manager, mm. uh, which is what I've been for the past. Uh, when was 2018? 2018. Uh, it was almost like six, five. Yeah, five six years. Five five six years ago. Yeah, I've been a talent manager, but then I've also worked as a digital marketing consultant uh, specialist. Half of that part, I was more of a digital consultant than. Uh, talent manager but now since last year I've decided to really take it on as the main thing that I do so in talent management I'm working with talents doesn't matter what kind of talent it is whether it's in the arts sports business even and anything else really if anybody is talented then we can now make that a bankable kind of uh, venture for the person if it's what they do for a living Oh, wow. Yeah. And as Diana the person, <laughs> who is Diana the person? A mother, first and foremost. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of everything that I'm going to be doing in my life is influenced or somewhere, somehow considering that I'm a mother. So it's the first thing. And I'm also <laughs> a woman. <laughs> I'm <Ellie. laughs> <laughs> now these days you need to say mm -hmm. I'm also a woman and that comes with um actually I don't I don't know if I can truly separate myself from the professional to the myself because it's very so intertwined. Mm. Uh first of all I work from home. Mm. Uh then I am not employed by an organization, so I work for myself, mm. freelancing and stuff. So everything goes together what I've had to do as a person is to make sure that my lifestyle is in support 100% of what I have to do mm. work wise mm. for example my weekend stopped being Saturday and Sunday when I started working in the music industry my weekend uh, or the day that I get to rest that I choose to rest most of the time is a Monday of which on that Monday I still have to do school run I still have to do the other work uh, for the corporates that I have to do and engage with everybody else from the music and etc. So it's one person. <laughs> wow, you have you have a very interesting full life. Uh -huh. So tell me how how do you when you when you say talent manager? I know mm -hmm. someone will be looking at you like talent manager. What does a talent you know manager do? You know what do you do? What is what is the day in the life of of you, of a, of a talent manager. So as a talent manager, you're working at the, firstly, the branding of the, of the talent that you're managing. So for example, if you're working with a musician, there is the branding of who is the musician, uh, what are they to the people, or what do they want to be to the people, how do they want to be known, how do they want people to relate to them, and then that comes with all the other work that falls in that path. Uh, these are the activities that they will do. Where are they going to be recording their music and ETC? Uh, how are they going to be selling that music? Where, which platforms are they going to be selling that music? So all those things, the platforms, they need to be created for starters, mm -hmm. and then they need to be managed on a day to day. And then after that, there is the product that they make, which is the music or the performances or the brand ambassadorship, whatever it is we call those. Uh, those are the products that they have. Those products will need to be sold to a clientele. 
And then that becomes the people that you have to liaise with on a daily basis, whether they're making inquiries, whether they're following up on tasks, whether you are following up on payments. <laughs> it is the it is the all the way to when people now have this person, this person and their music they know, okay. So that is uh the musician and that musician who did this song which is on this platform or on TV like this or the video. It, so all that stuff needs to be managed from the side of the artist, which is the product creation, to the market, where and, and the marketing now becomes involved where you distribute to the different plat- through the different platforms to the consumer of that product. So I, I think I'm speaking in a bit more technical <laughs> no, I, I guess me because I'm I've got a marketing background, so I kind of like understand. <laughs> but I'm just I'm just um I'm just uh, fascinated, you know, as you're speaking because I I I come from my background is also marketing and branding, but more um FMCG goods, you know, uh, like physical products, you know, tangible oh, yeah, yeah. products. And uh, at one time I dabbled into medical aid and uh, other things. But what I want to understand from you is how you got into this, you know, let's go back to when you were young, you know, did you ever think you were going to become a a marketer of talent, you know? I mean, talk to me about Diana, the young girl, and how you evolved to become a talent talent manager. So out of interest, I didn't even think of this five years ago. (laughs) Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) So let's start here. What were you doing before that? Um, I went to... Uh, Polytechnic College to Mtare Poly. Shout out to my Mtare Poly people. <laughs> and uh, I was doing IT, um, a diploma in information technology. And my interest became, from attachment, my interest became graphic and website designing. And I think um, up to around 2010 to 2012, I then started to brand myself because the course di- was not that deep. It was just a year of a module mm-hmm. where you are introduced to something and then you learn the basics. I came out of there knowing how to create a website at least, uh, but that was all. Uh, in terms of graphic design, whilst you're making website, you need to create those banners and those mm-hmm. graphics and stuff. I, I found that quite fascinating. Mm-hmm. And then I decided, okay, let me learn on this. But when I went to South Africa, I was around 25. Why did you go to South Africa? Um, my auntie called me over when I finished uh, college. And she said, come here, I'll take you to university and get you a job. It is the, it is the. Then I went. I, I was just visiting. And two weeks later, I met a friend who was a senior in college. And he said uh, they were lecturing at a college in Johannesburg, CBD. And then he asked me to come and be a lecturer there. Wow. Uh, at the college, and I'm like, uh, but I've never done something like this. And he said, I'm oh, not, these are not college college students. They are between matric and college at now. So we can do this. So I went there and we worked there for a month and a half. And I was an IT lecturer. How was that experience? <laughs> that was wild. Uh, Your big is wild. Yeah. <laughs> that experience of, of teaching that, that those few months, how what did you learn from that? I mean, what how was that experience for you? Um, if anything, it actually got me to realize that I had something to give. Like I had accumulated a lot of knowledge from my own university uh, college days, and it was it was also wild because some of these these were not like children; these were young adults, and it was a mix of, of okay, it was actually a mix of everybody. You'd have your sixteen year olds. You'd have the 18, 21-year-olds and grown-up family people. So I was even lecturing much older people than me. So it, it, was, it was a learning curve. And then the some of the students did not even understand what I was talking about. So I came out thinking we are so blessed coming from our background is, uh, of education in Zimbabwe where you would leave college and able to actually Twitter or lecture and mm. teach other people what you have learned because you'd, you'd, you'd get something. I remember one day I went into the class and I asked somebody to give me the notes that they were writing. 
that day what I saw. <laughs> so this was a, a a young adult who could not even right. take down notes. And then I went around the class to check on everybody else. But what I saw that day made me start rethinking what I was doing there because I felt, okay, we are doing this, but then I'm probably not the right person to be teaching at this level because mm. there was obviously a gap. a gap. And what I thought I was actually doing was not what was on paper. Mm. And from there, I started <laughs> doubting myself and saying, eh, no, I can't do this. And the other guys that I was working with said, ah, don't worry about that. We are here to get money. Mm. So just do what you do. And there was one uh, student who took us out for lunch with a core lecturer. And then he said, uh, guys, I've taken you for lunch afterwards. And this is the case. Um, a family man, I've got two children, I've got a job. And when I go back to this job, I'm supposed to have this certificate. If I don't have this certificate, it means I won't get promoted. So I'm telling you this so you know what is at stake and you know what has to happen. So I'm like, oh, okay. When we left, I asked my colleague, what, what just mean? happened? Yeah. <laughs> then he said, no, he's telling us that we have to make him pass. Yeah. I was like, but it's, it's not like he's really getting what he had. And then the mm. guy said, no, but this is it. This is real life. Mm. So you have to make it work for everybody. That's when I became quite uncomfortable mm. with the whole thing. Mm. And then when I left from there, I got offered to be a technical recruitment consultant. Mm. And I said to my uncle then, who then became my boss for the next seven years, I told him, uh, no, mm -hmm. I have no idea what uh, recruitment is, but I don't even know HR. I mean, I didn't even study HR. Yeah. Then he said, no, 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 no. I've seen the work that you, you can do because I had helped him uh, create a website for his organization. Mm -hmm. He said, I've seen the work you do. I think you get it. You will, I will train you. And he was quoting me for the next three months and I would just simply say no. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, eventually I said, ah, okay, it's not really working for me lecturing. College, yeah. So let me give this a try. And mm -hmm. then I went over and started uh, as a technical recruitment called trainee. Mm -hmm. And three months later, I got it. Mm -hmm. So what happened is um, it had a lot of, to do with the... Um, uh, admin and they would take CVs and then put them in a better uh, frame them better mm -hmm. for the clientele so that the the, the candidates the, the the workers would be sellable for for their new employers and stuff. Mm -hmm. So for me, I went in there and I started applying the stuff that I knew uh, in terms of uh, IT. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, working on a web document is nothing if you have done programming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did that and I did it so well. And the quality of our work improved, uh, the CVs that we'd send out. I remember it used to be only the two of us in the office, but people would be surprised if we ever told them, like our clientele would be like, no way. Because uh, they would think we are coming from a huge, huge organization with uh, rows and rows of employees mm -hmm. and what. So for me, the feedback that I was then getting from my boss then, he became my trainer for real and my... Uh, mentor for the next seven years that I worked with him. That was the man who then shaped me uh, in terms of who I became as a business person. Mm. One of the main things that he taught me is you get into your office, you have to check um, if, if you need to take coffee or whatever, do that and then settle down and then check your emails. Uh, first thing, there should not be any email, any blue, any unread email on you. Once you're checking them, respond the, to the ones that need to be responded to there and then if there is action that needs to be taken put it on the side and then uh that's it if there is something that you need to get rid of send it to the trash box and that was so hard at first to just delete <laughs> you know. yeah it's a simple thing but it was so complicated yeah. and you're feeling bad you're feeling all right then said no no you don't need to feel bad be clinical about this and i became that person who was so organized though Physically in the office when it comes to papers and what, what, what I, I am not so organized. Mm. And you then tried to make me do, what is it called? Filing, like physical filing. I told him no ways because I had no experience and I didn't know how to. So I just uh, hit with that other digital person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I became. I digitally. <laughs> yeah. So I started to make things easy for myself. 
and then became so savvy with anything digital so that uh, my life would be easy with the work and everything. And um, three months later, I was a, he said I was a fully fledged uh, digital, consult, um, not digital, uh, re technical recruiter because mm -hmm. I was that good. So he mm -hmm. said, and he was like, okay, I'm, I'm so amazed because I've worked with different people. I've tried to train different people, but it hasn't worked out. With you, you'll be able to do, you used to call me a young lady. That young lady, you'll be able to do anything you want to do in your life. Wow. And do you think what those words that he spoke to you, that he said to you, you know, do you think they've shaped you into the woman that you've become? Oh, and yes. how? Oh, yes. They, they, they shaped me so much um, uh, uh, because from there, I knew that I came from just being a college student and I could lecture. And then now I was a technical recruiter and we were recruiting for a very big organization, the FMCG clients in South Africa. And we were recruiting for mostly artisans mm -hmm. and uh, all the way up to engineering managers, factory mm -hmm. managers. It is, so these were big people. The meetings that we would have with a clientele would be with your directors, your CEOs, your operations managers, human resources managers. If you're talking of a human resources manager of an organization like Colgate Palmolive. Mm. That's huge. Mm. And at first I would be like, oh, even he was like, okay, you don't have to have conversations with the clients until I know you're ready for that. So it, at first I was a bit scared. And then after some times I realized mm, when you're talking to a person, you're talking to a person. Everybody loves to be respected. Everybody loves kindness. Everybody loves just the general courtesy. It doesn't matter which stage the person is, whether they are a general worker or a whole factory manager. Mm. So from there, I became more confident and I knew that I could do this. Would go into the meetings and play our good cop, bad cop <laughs> clients. I also learned that some clients uh, would prefer to speak to him as a man. Mm. Some of them would prefer to speak to me. So we had our own way of communicating and knowing, okay, this is what's going on. One would always take the, uh, the, the backstage mm -hmm. and the other one would, until we close the deal, because mm -hmm. what we are going to do there is closing the deal. So once I was there, I also started sort of managing his life as a career man, because he was also very, very, very swamped. You know how it is for bosses is like literally the only other person in the office who knows everything, who's in charge of everything, if the salaries are needed. We were, I was looking at him. Mm. And then when we had other people working at, with us, and at some point we also had um, contract workers whom we were taking out to, the, to our clients as well. Mm. So that meant we had 20 people in the field working under us and I'm managing their salaries, I'm managing their general issues uh, and then Thor would obviously have a foreman there at the at the, at the factory mm. but the other or the other organization was happening yeah all those clients as well the our clients is in the candidates uh, that would then place became people that would talk to shape uh, make sure that if somebody's CV is not looking right or they're not talking right about anything. We coach them. We would meet up with them, coach them. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to speak. The client is interested in A, B, C, D, E. Are you sure you have done it before? If we, are, we become sure that the person has done it, then we show them how to present it mm -hmm. on paper and also during an interview. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was a lot of talent management. <laughs> so I didn't even know. At the time. Uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. I remember I also had a friend who was a soccer player in the national team. I think that time he was playing for Amazulu. Um, and I I don't know how now, but I managed to convince him to give me access to his Facebook. And I would post, like, I'm him. To a point where he said, please stop. Just, <laughs> he said, stop. He said, stop. Yeah, because it's like people are thinking it's me that they're having interaction with. And it was <laughs> becoming a bit uncomfortable for him. Because uh, most soccer people just have their Facebook and whatever. They don't really like right. post and uh, communicate. Maybe things have changed now. Mm. But that was like back in 2010. So mm. social media was it. Yeah, it we, we were just uh, learning to get the ropes, but it was a play center. Mm. 
for the most part for us. And we were not, they were not working so hard like to him, what's the problem? It's not like I'm saying anything that is negative, but I had actually learned to speak like him <laughs> mm. and, and, and all that. And the work as well as a recruiter, I was managing the organization's uh, social media platforms. By the time we then said we need to move with the times and go on social media as well as a business. So I'll just go to the bigger companies, recruiting companies, and check what kind of things that they post, what how they do, and I realize mostly they are probably putting tips on how to do interviews. Mm. Uh, they are putting the job specs that they had on their side. Mm. So I'll just do the same. The rest of the stuff that I wanted to experiment with, I'll do it with my personal social mm. media. <laughs> So I groomed myself and I think I was the first talent or maybe the second after the candidate, the, 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 the talent from the employers. Mm -hmm. I was the first talent that I managed. So I would say, okay, what do I want to be this year? What do I want to become? There was a year when I wanted to be a graphic designer uh, so that I would get clients. So I wanted people to know that I'm a graphic designer. Mm. I stepped out and started uh, branding myself. I didn't even know what I was doing then as a graphic designer until when anybody asks for a graphic designer, I would be recommended. Like I would be tagged all over. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, it's actually working, but I would get 90% uh, of my work or maybe 80% of my work from mm. social media. Mm. And then the other 20% would be recommendations. Uh, from other people. So word yes. of mouth kind of referrals wow. from the people that I had done work for. Mm. So I grew the graphic design thing alongside the technical recruitment thing is my uh, formal work. Mm. So I'd get money uh, here and there, or sometimes it was just for fun. Um, until it was around 2015, I got retrenched. So I had two children by then. At that talent company? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Things went bad and then I, I got retrenched. Mm. So they gave me a salary for the next two, three months. Mm -hmm. And that's all I had. And my firstborn was in uh, day, uh, not day, she was in preschool by then. Uh, the baby was like one and I'm out of work. So I'm like, ah, I'm so confident. I can do anything. I'll get work. My permit decided to expire that time. And I had gone and done the renewal, but the new permit had and then, so I'll get interviews, go, and then they'll say, oh, okay, I think we can consider working with you, but we'll have to we wait until your permits come out. out. Did the permit come out? April went by. Winter went by. Now, I think it eventually came out in October. But by then, I had sort of lost hope that I would ever get work, like for more work, and I had run out of uh, savings. We were now literally on survival mode. So after the kids, I'm um, asking friends for groceries, etc. That was that. So I said to myself, this is where now I need to fall back on my graphic design. And stuff. But the clientele that I had is the people that would come and say, please make me a birthday card for my child. And then we'll give you the money whenever. I didn't even follow up on the money because my salary would be coming. And I'll be like, ah, Marino Nagacherovaya. So I'd be waiting for when the money comes. It didn't matter. But now I needed the money. So I needed to now change the way I worked and have clients that would pay me deposits and pay me in full before I deliver the work. Mm -hmm. But then I also learned that you can't exactly shift the goals on your existing customers. It's not that simple. Mm -hmm. So some of them were understanding. Some of them were like, ah, oh, no, we've always worked with you this way. And I realized, oh, okay, okay. Uh, I now have to look for new clients whom I will groom the way I need them to be so that I get paid before. And from there, I made sure that I would have enough work to pay for my bills at the end of the month. Um, it's because you're really calculating each child, each thing. Yes. And then every job that you do, you're like, okay, this is giving me 300 rand. It means that we are left with... Uh, 4,700 rand to get our 5,000 rand mark. And then <laughs> you would work uh, until the 5,000 rand mark you have reached it. And then you say, okay, just for whatever else, then I need to work to, to add more, maybe a 2,500 extra 
just in case. Mm. And you're counting on the money that is not even on your side. And I would do the work. I remember I would deliver work at 3 a.m. when everybody is sleeping. That used to impress a lot of people and then they would pay on time or some of them would add a little bit more and stuff. But it wasn't enough because there were months when the work would not be enough because I'm now depending on whatever work I get. Thank you, good. Yeah. Mm. So things got real then. And I said, okay, what do I do? So I started trying to look for other ways to make this thing work. But I wasn't considering going back to work, really. Mm. I, I was now at peace with that. I'm a freelancer. Mm. And um, at some point, I got work at an ad agency, but as a term. But they would require us to come into the office maybe for the next three months. Then you get paid. Those were the relief moments. Mm. But it also got me a lot of exposure that I needed, a lot of um, uh, uh, training into the creative side mm. of things. So now in a full-fledged uh, advertising boutique, you're talking graphic design, motion design, photography, videography. Uh, you're talking working with different people, musicians. You're working with, so by the time I came back home in 2017-18, that's when I Why did you come back home? That situation, uh -huh. the no work situation uh. was becoming so heavy on me. So the first thing I said was like, ah, at some point, now I can't afford a mate. Uh, I have to have them, but I've, my children are so young. I can't leave them at home to go look for work. And I can't also concentrate and work with them at home because the other one is literally a baby. Mm. So, I said, Mama, for the first time in my life, I had vowed I would never send my children to live with anybody else, not even my mom. But I had people talk to me and say, you need to be realistic about your situation. You know those talks that you don't want to hear? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let me talk to Mama. And I called Mama and said, Mama, can I bring the children, please? Uh, because I'm going through this and I need to figure out. Coming back to Zimbabwe was not even... An option at the time. Nah, why would I come back to Zimbabwe? <laughs> <laughs> I have nowhere to start. I didn't even know what I would do in Zimbabwe. Mm. I tried to visit here and there. You visit, you see your friends, some, some of them living fancy lives. You're asking, how are you achieving this? Mm. But nobody tells you anything. Mm. So I'm like, oh, okay, what, what do I do? And I asked Mama to bring the children. It drove over. I left the children. And I think the first two weeks, I'm happy, I'm free, uh, you know. Oh, so you dropped them and you went back? Yeah. So How was that, leaving them behind and going back by yourself? It's just the hardest thing that I've ever, one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do. Like, I was just like, okay, I'm in a crisis. I have to do this. So I came and I left them and then I went back and I'm like, okay, at least I'm leaving them with my mom. If my mom loved me so much when I was young, it's so easy for it. They love my children. Mm. Yeah, and, and we grew up being told this, that your mom is the best person to take care of your children. children. So that kept me going. And I was like, also, I'm just in South Africa. If I need to come home, I'll just catch a bus. I couldn't even think of catching a flight. Right. <laughs> because I was broke. <laughs> then I went back. Um, first two weeks, ha, okay, this life is so good. No children. I can literally do anything. I can sleep solidly at night. Whatever. After that two weeks, you go to the mall. Um, the experience is different. Normally when you go to the mall, you've got the children, they're running around. So I would go to the mall and start seeing my children who are back at home running around and it's just, and then you know how that pulls at, your, at the strings mm -hmm. of your heart. It was hard. And I'm like, okay, I can't do this at some point. Even living in the same space was becoming unbearable. I missed them so much. I didn't want to not have them. So I started uh, making sure that I do my trips back home almost every other month when I could afford it. And now I'm spending more time on the road. That's not an easy trip either. Mm. And ah, life is becoming harder and harder for me. And then I said, ah, I really can't do this. I don't know why I'm doing this. Let me just go home. It was around after Christmas. Then I said, before the new year, before I take on new work and stuff, let me just go home. And then I managed to go home in February. Uh, I was also due with my rent anyway. And I said, I'm closing the house. 
for the next two months or a month or so whilst I go home. And then when I come back with new energy, then I'll start looking for another house and mm. whatever. The money, I'll work. Because mm. that's one thing that I always knew that I, I'll work for the money. Mm. So I, I went home and left my stuff at my tete's in South Africa. And then I came home in Zimbabwe. I lived, you know, the first week you're just, Seeing this person, that person, yeah, all over the place. Is what fine. year was this? 20. So the first time was 2017. Uh-huh. Uh huh. February 2017. Uh-huh. I'm like, oh, okay, and it's fun. You're going out with friends that you haven't seen in a long time. You're making new friends. You're yeah, watching. Third week, I'm like, okay, now I need to start looking for work. Right. So I started going around, sending my CVs out. Also, the people that I knew from social media, that had organizations and stuff, I would approach them and say, I can do A, B, C, D, E for you if you can allow me to do. Some of them would even say just for free because I knew I needed, uh, I needed, ex- yes. Exposure. And also for people to know that I'm now based mm-hmm. in Zimbabwe because mm-hmm. I was just that girl who was from South Africa to many people. And I realized it's not actually a good thing when you're looking to establish or looking for work and stuff because mm-hmm. people are like, ah, you're just here for on holiday, you'll go back. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't even know that I wouldn't go back either. Then I did that and it was, nothing was really yielding. But then I spent three months at home. I had nothing to rush for. I had my computer and the phone and the internet so I could still do work. And then I realized I'm happy. So I didn't know I wasn't happy when I was in South Africa. You were staying with mom <laughs> at this time. Were you staying with your mom? Yes, I went back to my mother's house. Mm. But you know what that does to your ego as well when you're growing up? <laughs> It wasn't the easiest person. And then Mama is also telling you, you have to be back in my house this time, that time. You have to wake up by 7 o'clock. And you're like, Mama, but you're not in your house. You're in my house. So in my house, by rules. Yeah. So <laughs> there's all that going on. And also, I'm generally heartbroken. I think I was depressed. I didn't even know it. Uh, from just the fact that I have failed in South Africa. So this is a thing that I just had myself in my heart without really sharing with anybody. So it was hard. But then I was so hopeful and I knew, and even though I may have failed, but then I have got these skills. I've got this exposure. I've got, I've got so many solutions to the problems that are back here at home that I can actually apply. But I don't have, really have any way to apply them. So I stayed three months and I really, socially though, I'm happier than I've ever been because um, I'm home. I'm free. I can speak in Shona <laughs> anytime that I want. I'm not scared of anything. And then possibilities of actually accumulating anything in terms of, uh, and I'll, I'll call it wealth. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the property. It, is, it, it looks, it's more real when you're back home because there's not so much bureaucracy mm. around it. So I'm an adult now and certain things are becoming more important for me. So I'm like, being home actually makes sense. But then I still hadn't made the decision that I want to be home. Mm. And I was still in between. I'm like, eh, let me just do this. But I was enjoying the social life. The work life was horrible. There was no money. I remember there was one time when I couldn't even afford to get 50 cents my vegetables. Oh, you need to go somewhere. You don't have the 50 cents to go to town. And I'm looking at myself and I said, but I worked 10 years of my life doing all this. Was that for nothing? I don't even have 50 cents. Yeah, and it, it was real. So you, you, you're facing all of that. You're looking around you. People are telling you I haven't been paid for the past six months. Some of them are going on a year, three years. Things were really going horrible for a lot of everybody. And now you're absorbing all of that. Uh, some of the things that used to hurt me so much would be like walking into a supermarket. You see a very grown man uh, comes to the till with, maybe margarine, bread, uh, oil, and maybe a pack of uh, diapers. And then they are deciding what to leave and what to take because the money is not enough. So I would notice things like that. They would break my heart. Would, you would walk into a place where they're selling food and they're selling for a dollar. And grown men that are at work are actually buying that. For lunch and you're thinking so what is going on so those are the things that would touch me mm-hmm. and when i would go back on social media and talk about it uh some of my friends would say ah, you're just comparing lifestyle to, to essay like no 
this is wrong and it felt really wrong. And I also realized I'm quite an empath, so I didn't know why I was going through all this. Because oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> I would notice the weirdest things. Mm. Like, I would notice you go to a workshop, um, you're planning to give people food, and then you ask, um, do you guys, is there anybody who doesn't eat pork or what? And then everybody says no, and then they eat that food. So I'm like, how? Yeah, and then you realize they don't have that much option. So whatever is coming to them is, is what they so, so I would notice all these things and it would break my heart. So before my own situation, I, would, I started noticing other, other people's situations and it was a hard year. It was very heartbreaking. And then I think that's when I also decided that I need to do something to change this, even if it's for one or two people. Like... Mm. I had to do something. I didn't know what, what? I didn't know how, mm. but all I knew is that I've got this skill set in me. Mm. And then towards the end of that year, um, there was a uh, vanilla, uh, you know, when you're just moving in circles, mm. there were young musicians. I went there. I don't know what I need. I, I needed my laptop fixed. And then I was introduced to these kids. Uh, they said they do music. And they're like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm into branding and marketing. Uh, I'd always <laughs> and graphic design and what I knew what I would, I did and I would always talk about it. and they said so maybe you can help us uh, like what do you do I said uh, we are musicians and we are, we've been trying to push our music can you listen to this and then they show you their music and stuff and I'm like oh maybe can I <laughs> yeah. uh, but then I was like I don't really know how I can help you I don't even have money I don't even know how to help myself. And then these kids are like, no, but you have what we need. I'm like, I don't even know about music that much. I, I just consume, you know, mm. passing by and what, what, what. Then they're like, no, 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 you will actually be good for what we need done. So let's just give this a try. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, maybe let's have a meeting. You guys tell me more about the music thing. Vele, I know how to market. Uh, but for business, yeah. even so it wasn't a coincidence. Maybe it was God says, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what you're asking me, so do, I'm not sure. And then they're like, okay, let's give it a try. They showed so much hope in me. They showed so much faith, and they showed they they, they believed in me. And then I started questioning myself. Which am I just not believing in myself when I should be? Then I said, let's do this. Then we started working on them. So I would I used to order, uh, have a camera then because in 2015, I started loving photography. So I bought myself a camera. So I had a camera then and I would be like, oh, okay. So you guys basically need to improve your image. And then I started taking the photos myself, the things that I needed to be done. I would do their graphic designs, take on their social media platforms. I'd done this before in the corporate. Mm. But I didn't know how to do it for a musician. I'm like, I don't even know how to speak as a musician. Mm. So they're like, I don't know, don't worry about that. We'll also take you to our spaces. So I'd go to the studio with them. If they have, there is a show or they have a show, I would also attend. Not really. I've never really been an outgoing person. So shows and what <laughs> <laughs> it would be noisy yeah. for me. <laughs> <laughs> the irony, though. <laughs> and look where you are. <laughs> yeah, so I then went into that. and But in November, I was like, okay, November 2017, a lot was happening in the country. I was like, okay, this is it. I'm done trying. I've I'm failed. Back. Zimbabwe. I'm going back to South Africa. So um, I also had to go and apply for my permit because I was like, I, I don't want to let my permit go yet. I still have bank accounts that I didn't order. So they had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so a friend of mine then said, uh, I'll pay for your travel and you can stay at my house. And uh, and then she said, um, uh, then I'll also pay for your fees for the permit renewal because I'm also doing mine. Thank you so much, Sharon, for that. <laughs> So we did that and I went over to South Africa with my suitcase again. <laughs> and this is 2018 now. 2017, oh, end November. Of year. Yeah, yeah, end of year. And then I went there. So for the first time, I didn't have a home in South Africa. I was staying at my friend's house. I could visit my family, etc. but I didn't have a home. So I didn't have, I wasn't tired. I didn't have much responsibility and stuff. So I started enjoying the place differently and seeing the place differently. Mm -hmm. 
I started doing a, a bit of blogging of what I was doing uh, and I was behaving like a tourist mm -hmm. whilst I was there. So I we, we, we did Johannesburg, we went to Hatties, you know, the weekend mm -hmm. thing in South Africa at some point. And then there was a, there was a meeting that happened uh, with the new president mm -hmm. where he was meeting the business people in oh, South yes, Africa. Yes, yeah, yes. And I happened to be there and I had my camera and... I was taking photos and stuff. So I would just post about all these things. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Suddenly, people from home that I had been trying to court to give me work started reaching out to me and saying, when are you coming back? We need to work. So I'm like, but how does this work? <laughs> I was waiting for a whole year. <laughs> <laughs> and I ignored the first of them. And then this kept happening. And I went, I also went to... Cape Town, I went to East London, and then at some point I went to Mozambique, um, I stayed there a month. How were you funding now. all this? So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was partly work. So when I went back to South Africa, it was uh, those people that I used to do work for were like, oh, you're back, please come through, we need to do this. Some, some of it, it was friends would say, oh, okay, why don't you visit me over in Cape Town? I'm like, okay, but I'm, doing, I'm not doing anything really, it makes sense. When I go, I spend... New Year's in Cape Town. I come back. But the whole time I was actually blogging the thing. Mozambique was work as well. And it's travel. I'm blogging. And people started seeing me differently, I guess. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Mm. But people, when, when you're confident, when you're doing stuff, people also want to be part of it. Mm. Before that, when I was like begging, please give me like this, that, no videos. Mm. And then... The weirdest thing happened, uh, I was back in, in, in Joburg in February 2018 now, because I did the whole in and out, in and out, in and out. And then I was back and uh, there was this business person, business in but he's late now. We may so rest in, in peace. Um, he then said, we need to work. I've been, I was referred to you by so-and-so and also I've been watching your work which is really generally my personal life <laughs> on social media. And I think you're the right person that we need in our organization to come into this. And like, but I'm in South Africa and said, so what? I'll pay for your flight. Uh, send the details. And then I did. I'm like, yeah, wait. Then he paid for a flight and hotel accommodation for me in Arara because I was like, I stay in Maranja. So I came through, we met, and then that was my first engagement. And then uh, as a digital marketing consultant then. Then I got two other gigs. And those gigs were then to change my life because for the first time I had income that was enough to even change my phone and my laptop. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I realized my tools for work were that phone and the laptop, my mm. phone. Then, you know, when you're moving around with a cracked phone and you just like every time... You you unconsciously open it when there are people. You're almost like, okay, please. Can I just can the, can the can the floor just swallow me up? So I was that things were that bad, but I was I kept pushing, and then I kept the positive uh, vibe on social media and stuff. And then my musicians, uh, those two, Vanel and Ken from Taza, were still there. So I'd come. I'm staying at the hotel. Please come through. Let's take photos. <laughs> we found space. We found the environment that is. Yeah. So do that. Um, but then my thing is, if you're doing a lifestyle thing, you also have to be realistic. You can't always take photos at the hotel mm. when you know you don't leave there. So you have to normalize it and think so that mm. uh, they are normal. So uh, we would go there, take photos. I remember one time we were having, I then found out you can actually have coffee, tea at Miku's, at the tea. Coffee tea. shop, yeah, and it would cost something like two bucks. Yeah. <laughs> so and instead of doing that, let's meet and uh, be in a cool environment where we take the kind of lifestyle photos that pe will make people believe that we are actually doing something. Yeah, mm. it is. It is. So I would do that, and then the little income that was now coming, um, and uh, get my lenses for my cameras. Um, I've got my, and now I can even buy groceries for my mom. Like, things are now hey, shaping up. Hmm. Hmm. And I had been telling mom that, because she had this thing of saying, you have to find work. Hmm. Then I did my market survey, and work meant you have to 
to give somebody eight hours of your life and they give you three hundred dollars or something, which I could get in one gig as a as a creative. Yeah. Which I would always try to convince my mom that I can do this. Uh I just need the clients and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then she's leaving the house. I'm sleeping on the couch. All she's seeing is mm-hmm. somebody who's not working. So <laughs> sleeping. It's sleeping. And then she comes back, um, probably because the, there was also the electricity issue mm. where you work through the night. <laughs> and then <laughs> 5, 6 a.m., that's when you're sleeping. 7 a.m., that's when everybody's leaving for work. You're now taking a nap, but they don't realize that you've been working through the night. It was actually working because you would deliver the work in the night and make sure everything mm. is done. During the day, you're on the phone and doing what needs to be done, the communication and what, what, and research. And then in the night, you're on the computer because that's when you have power and you work through the night and so my lifestyle was totally different from what was normal <laughs> but yeah the, the money was now starting to come in and i one of the things that i wanted to do was to change a bit of my mom's furniture and my your tv doesn't work get a new tv you know um even able to send my dad a few hundred dollars you know what does what that does to yeah. you <laughs> Or even tens of dollars. It, mm. it, it means something else. I'm like, okay, I'm back. I can do this. And then the music people, uh, I was also doing what I could with those guys uh, since they were up and coming as well. So there's not much going on around you. One time, I think Davido came, was was in the country. And we happened to be at the hotel where he was doing his press conference. So I'm like, guys... <laughs> Come. I've got my camera. So no one was asking me anything. So whenever I walked around with my camera, no one would ask me anything. So I'm like, let's go in. Then we went. We did the press conference. I was checking my photos. And then when they're done, I was like, I didn't even get a photo moment. Because I was like to my guys, go in. in. <laughs> Make sure. And then I took the photo. So I'm like, if I'm not in the photo, at least I'll have my signature. Yeah. Moment. And then, yeah. And then that, that, that worked out. So I was becoming known to be doing that and being in these spaces it is because most people wouldn't even understand what what exactly do you do <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah and then by chance um we organized the zim dance for summit mm. with uh these guys actually approached me and said we need somebody with your kind of a uh, portfolio and the uh, so that you 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 help us with the organizing and the marketing and etc. And also, we don't have a woman on our team. So this was somebody in the UK. And I'm like, okay, I'm in. But I don't know anything about music. And they said, ah, no, don't worry. These guys, no. So I went in there and then they would feed me with the information that I would need. And then I was doing the liaison with the artist to say, okay, you're supposed to come here on the panel. This is your time. And then communicating to them until on the end of the day. And when the we did the conference, that was the first time that I met uh, Nati O and his manager. Uh, I was just like, wow. So I had heard his music being played. I think it was one of the readings, the one with Tundu <laughs> His song, the Boom mm. And um, the, on, on, on there, I was like, but who's this guy? Because he sounds very different. Mm. And then they said he's Zimbabwe. For some weird reason, I told myself he can't be in Zimbabwe. He lives somewhere else. Mm. And then when I, they came through, I just believed what I told myself. Mm. That they live in Zimbabwe. So I'm like, ah, oh, you're in Zimbabwe. And he's like, yeah. And I was doing the communication with the manager. They came through. We said hi with the artist. Obviously, it took our photos. Mm. It is the end. I remember posting about it. Which, wow, this guy is impressive. Because he was given a microphone then in the on that on that stage and he spoke because he was speaking. And he spoke unlike uh, a regular musician. Wow. Because what I knew for musicians to be is just uh, music heads. So they can't speak. Yeah, they're not. Most of them don't even bother them mm, to try. Yeah, but things have since changed as well. But back in the day, it would just be, ah, eh, they're musicians. Mm. They're just mm. in the back seat. And some of them were told not to speak in case mm. they say something wrong. Mm. And then, but then there was this guy speaking confidently. And he even uh, rattled some 
<laughs> I remember I said something about uh, older musicians uh, that they he didn't even know any of their most of them or their work except through the music that he knows. Mm. So there was no continuation, so to mm. speak. That's what he was saying then. And this is back in 2018. Wow. But the older guys that were in there were sort of offended. Mm. <laughs> and they're saying, why are you saying that? What, uh, but then I was like, ah, but there's no need for you to be offended and maybe shouting at the young man. Mm. At least if you're in a better position of knowledge, let him know what he doesn't know. Furnish mm. uh, him with the information. Him. Yeah, mm. that was just my stance. And I'm just like, oh, okay, that went well. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the, uh, after that, uh, the communication had started between me and his manager, the, the then manager. And then um, I remember we went out for coffee after that and we started talking. He had also come from Namibia. And then this was some, someone speaking the same language that I wanted mm. to hear. We were relating on so many things. And then from there, we became family. Mm. And that was how I then met uh, 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 the Nati O team and then eventually met Nati O away from uh, the uh, that and it was always either they're going to a show or they're actually at a show or doing something or sometimes at home these guys would always be playing his music and hyping and talking about things so when when that is happening you're actually learning oh okay oh, you did that you did that oh you guys are doing that and you could see the vision. You could see. I was also shocked that how is somebody who was born and bred in uh, Zimbabwe, but not only in Zimbabwe, in Mbare, actually able to do this and know this. I felt challenged to say, wow, if somebody can actually come up with this from there, what's stopping you, me? And also it, it gave me that thing that I needed to help like, I just felt that I, I had to do what I could to also make this story go as far as it should go. Mm. So there was my, just my stance to say, wow, this is so inspiring. I would love him to get known. I had over 5,000 friends on Facebook then. And I, uh, I would consider myself, ah, I'm just a regular person. Mm. He had, he had um, less than that. But then he was on TV, he was on radio, he was so it didn't make sense to me. And then I dedicated myself from there to say, I'm going to do everything that I can do to help these guys achieve what they want to achieve as much as they will allow me. Mm. So that was it. So becoming family and everything is just started working together. I think from then in 2018, it was winter 2018. And as fate would have it. We, 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 I would, I would, I would go to the shores where they would go, carry my camera through, record what I could record, uh, also give my contribution on the marketing side. You guys should do this. At first, it was a bit difficult because they're like, Who are you? And also, sometimes they would take it like you're looking down on what you're doing. Mm. And then I'm saying, No, 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 it's, 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 yes, it may be creed, but not in that way. I'm just saying, You can do this better and you can mm. do this. And then as we worked, certain results started showing from wow. my side. Mm -hmm. And he, well, he's always been this hardworking person. With the music, he's always made the most amazing music. Mm -hmm. So you're just like, okay, how do we now take this and put it out there? How do mm -hmm. we take this and put it out there? Because you, you feel challenged to say, people must hear this, people not, must know about this. this. But what I didn't even know or realize then was I was actually working at that level of, maybe an international or international level where you're actually doing the work. So for me, it was just, this looks like it can be done better than mm -hmm. and that would do. Mm -hmm. And up to a point where people started realizing that we were working together, it is it, 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 and then people started uh, associating me with him. But then that comes with a lot of hardship, so to speak, because when it's about art and artists, it's, Super stardom, it's stardom. Mm -hmm. So the peop the the way people view it is very different from probably the way we see it. So we are just doing our work and doing what we have to do in it. But when people are seeing it, they're seeing the glory. Mm -hmm. They're seeing everything else, and everything is heightened over there. Yeah. So that's where sometimes it became uncomfortable to say, "Oh, okay, people want me to behave a certain way." 
to do things a certain way. They are pulling me out. They now my comment matters. Mm. But for me, we are just doing our work. work. Yeah. So, so that um, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it was a bit of a shift, mm. and then also in a positive way, it made me realize that we are actually working at a high level mm. on that work. Mm. So, I became part of the team that way. Wow! And at some point, I became conscious of the kind of work that you're doing. So when you're working that side of things, you don't talk about stuff that you're doing. <laughs> Almost everything is confidential and it is the until it's ready for the magazine. Wow. Yeah. And also, you also have to be very careful who you interact with. You don't just bring anybody just because you've met them there and you're bringing them into your space or mm. the space of the artist. It's, it's sort of sacred. Mm. So you, you become guardy. It's, it's, mm. it's, it's, so I, I was learning quietly, but then the beauty of it was I was also in the background because there was the manager, the artist, who had, were doing their things. Things went wrong or whatever. It didn't really matter to me uh, because I wasn't directly responsible. Mm. And then came 2021, early 2021, the other manager... Uh, left the team, um, and or oh, the, the and and suddenly we had this gap where we were just like children, <laughs> no, <laughs> no parent, <laughs> yeah, and we had an album that was about to come out. Uh, I, I'd gone and I'd listened to the album. I'd gone to the studio and listened to the album, and it's like wow. And I remember giving him a whole paragraph of response about the album mm. for him going about a song after song after song they oh wow oh, oh, oh. uh but then there were more songs then than we eventually put out and he then came to me and asked uh may you step up and be take the place of the manager but because of our relationship it was also complicated my relationship with the with the other manager it was complicated for me to say if he is leaving, I was probably supposed to also take over. Oh no, leave, leave wow. with him. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. That's what that's what uh, naturally made sense. Mm. So I was split. So the, because I didn't see this as some glory thing or anything, I saw it as work that needed to be done, as work that we had been entrusted with, as. Uh, a responsibility. Mm. So for me to walk away was also hard. Mm. So I was split in between these two saying they're separating mm. and this one asking me to step up and me saying, but uh, no. But then in my heart, I know I can't step away from the artist mm. uh, because the way I look at it, it's, 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 it's a responsibility. When somebody trusts you, with their life's work, mm. that's that kind. Of, <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot, and I had to pray to say, God, what are you saying? What should I do? And you know how the, the uh, God's answer it doesn't like come, mm. <laughs> not, or at least not in clear ways to say, do this, do that. So I didn't know what to do, and I was split. And then the fighting among us now became even more intense because my person is saying. Let's leave. You can't stay there because you were there because of me. Your heart is saying you can't. This, if he hadn't particularly reached out to me, I would probably have just slid away you know, with a guilty heart. Mm -hmm. But then he had also directly reached out. Yeah. So now I split. And then I, I, I went to my person and I told him, uh, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. We, uh, as, uh, however, we ended up here. We have been entrusted with this. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility. This is not even about us. This is not about the artist. Mm -hmm. At this point, we have grown this thing and it's now at national level. Mm -hmm. We have a good project that is coming up, so you can't step down. Mm -hmm. If you want to step away, it's okay. Step away. I'll hold on for you mm -hmm. until you are okay to come back. Because I thought you <laughs> I thought you would come back. Mm -hmm. like, everybody on the team thought it's one of those. Because, you know, we are always having drifts and what, mm. but you still maintain relationships and the main thing, because mm. the main thing is bigger than all of us. Mm. So we all thought, so I said, it's okay, but I'm going to be honest with you. For now, it will feel like I'm defying you and ETC, and I am 
but I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay. And I would love to have peace in my house after I've stayed and done this mm-hmm. way. So we sort of made an agreement that though maybe grudgingly on his end, but he was like, okay, I give you my blessing to what you're doing. Let's, let's see how this would do. But I'll tell you this thing won't work because A, B, C, D, E, because he had also his legit issues mm-hmm. uh, over what was going on on there. Then I became the manager. And I even told him, I'm scared. I don't think I can do this. And he said, oh, no. Queen, you can do it. You've got children. They need to be taken care of. We've got a good thing going on here. And we're going to go- grow big. We're going to get to get a li- to get a living out of this. So <laughs> somebody talks about your children and <laughs> and their upkeep. That's a different good conversation. Good conversation <laughs> altogether, yeah. <laughs> and as a mother, just when they target your heart, you know. Yeah, so I'm like, okay, let's do this. But I, I also, I'm not sure if I know exactly what to do because all along I've just been there and doing or not doing. It didn't matter if I did or didn't. But suddenly, I was so responsible for everything. And then I just took it in the stride. Um, now pulling in all the, that knowledge from marketing, from talent management, this, that, that, that. And saying, okay, we are all systems go. And the relationships that we had then were so powerful because we had um, XQ, mm-hmm. DJ Tamuka. These are people that have been in the industry mm-hmm. for so long and they were also guiding mm-hmm. where we were not sure. We had our own hearts because mm-hmm. I, I know that he always is writing on his heart and instinct. And because mm-hmm. that's, that's what most of it is. It's intuition, it's heart, it's, 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 it's instinct. If you are not listening to yourself, a lot of things will go wrong. So things that we needed to consult on would then consult on. Things that we needed people to take on because that's what we are feeling, that's what we are thinking, mm-hmm. then would also force fully because it's not an easy yeah. It's not an easy industry. You're also forcing certain things. You're also bowing on certain things. Uh. And the relationships around you also have to be very healthy. If you find yourself in uh tricky relationships that will affect everything as well so these little selves these little this is about me this is about what uh we had uh the artist with his own people and his own relationships i had my own uh people that that i got along with and didn't get along with he had his own that he got along with and didn't get along with but at some point we had to make certain things work so whether I got along with somebody or I didn't, if we it made it that work. somebody, we had to make things, things work. work. So there was a lot of maturing in a short space of time. There was a lot of growing and also bouncing things off each other to say, okay, honestly, this is what's happening. We can't do this because I don't get along with that. Mm-hmm. So who from our team can then now bridge the gap or from outside that we can reach out to to Back to your HR days where your boss, you know, you would do that. <laughs> yeah. And then the team itself. Now we've had people that are on the team who are just there because uh, they're good at this or that or they're friends or what, what. But now we are moving into a space where we know this is the professional game. We need to step up. We need mm. to, to, to skill up. We need mm. to. So we said it. Uh, now I'm saying, okay, we need this person because A, B, C, D, we need that person, but let's skill each other up. Let's train each other. Let's support each other. So I also started growing my team in the team uh, that he already had. And then oh, and, 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 and we grew into, it, it took some time, <laughs> but we grew into what is now really a working uh, system. Wow. Yeah. And then the album came out. That was something else that was that was overwhelming. That was amazing. We expected it to be okay because we knew that's all we had. We had gone to the corporates and everywhere, telling them we've got an amazing project coming mm. out. You want to be part of it? Some of them did not think the same. Mm. <laughs> so then the music came out and it did better than we had even anticipated because we thought, yeah, well, it's gonna just gonna be. But then we didn't know what that meant because that meant more work being booked uh, every weekend or sometimes almost every day. Uh, that meant the band was growing. That meant the whole team itself had to grow. 
it meant a lot of things that we were not ready for, that we had not been trained for, that we were not equipped for, all of us as a team. But we would just go back to that core team and say, guys, this is what's up. I'm thinking we need to do A, B, C, D, E. He's thinking we need to do A, B, C, I'm the only female on the team anyway. <laughs> He's thinking we need to do everything. Sometimes you're pulling away, someone thinks differently. And we then had to learn to listen to each other. Because that's what I wanted to actually ask. <laughs> How do you work with artists? Because I think artists, I can't say irrational, but sometimes artists, you know, the way they think mm. and the way corporates or the way we, th I think we, you know, when you're a corporate person, you're very structured and artists think in a, not a very structured way. Mm -hmm. So how do you marry the two? How do you make sure so, the two are working? So, so it's easy and it's uneasy working with an artist. The fact that they are not structured means you're also free to be whatever you want to be. But then it also means what you're saying that you're working against the grain because if you're now doing the business, it needs to be structured. So that's when we would pull in each other's. So for me, it was firstly identifying exactly what each person is really strong at, their strengths, what they are good at in ETC. So with the artists, we know that when it comes to the music, we are solid that I don't even have to follow him at the mm. studio or whatever. I just want to deliver. Yes. Mm. So that was communicated at first that that's your thing. You are delivering and we all trust you and depend on you. And then when it comes to myself, I was then uh, named the corporate uh, manager of the team. Mm. We also have a logistics manager on the team. So we are co-managing and then we would then uh, handle the um, gigs, the, 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 the clientele, the engagements together, sort of. So I get an inquir inquiry. Um talking to the client and getting all the information that I need from them, then back to the tip. This is what we have. What do you think? Can we do this? What do they have? M the money that we need is so much. They only have so much. But what else can we do to leverage on the other part of the money? Because remember, this is when you have broken out. You need exposure. Mm. But then you also need the money. money yeah. So there has to be a balance. So now my business brain is now coming into work Full force. Mm. The, the artist's uh, creative brain is working full force. Oh. The logistics manager is also very great with business and mature. <laughs> mm. <laughs> because among us, is the most mature and most calm. So when we are spiraling, he's mm. always mm. grounding mm. us. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so that, 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 that then becomes what works. And we literally also drew down our operations way, our standards, etc that we then uh, made sure that each team member knows this is how we behave when we're out there. We are ABX. This is who we are. This is what we do. This is what we are. And that's what we expect. We are a brand. We are a brand. This is uh, oh, our fees. So firstly, whatever con information comes in, whoever wants to talk, direct them to this person or that person. If they insist on talking with you, which is okay, especially with the artists, at least some people felt they wanted to talk to the artists. So we say don't shut them out, mm -hmm. accommodate them, but bring it back so we discuss and then we speak one language. Mm -hmm. So that has been the main thing that has worked for us. We speak one language. Mm -hmm. So it's working the team mm -hmm. to then work with mm -hmm. the team. Wow. Uh -huh. That is so fascinating. So in all that, I mean, you've transcended, you've transcended, you've, you were IT, uh, HR, uh, <laughs> South Africa, back home, um, now uh, working with um, artists. Give me five key lessons that you have learned in the last 40 years. Odd years, you're 41, 41 <laughs> odd years, but mostly in that time, because I think that's the time you've really evolved. What are the five key life lessons that you could give people out there? You know, um, the first one would be fear not for you. You have overcome the world already. Mm. So fear not uh, whatever it is that is coming your way. Mm. Find ways to go through it. Learn about it and apply yourself mm. fear not mm. 
uh, the second thing would be you're only human. Uh, there are a lot of things that will come your way that you probably don't know about yet uh, <laughs> that that you're not uh, expectant of it to see. You're only human. Do what you can. Uh, reach out to other humans. Plenty other humans. All of their work is to serve you, so to speak. Mm. Reach out and collaborate. Mm. Uh, the third thing would be... Mm, what my dad told me when I was much younger, he said everything that you would do is a foundation for the next step or the next thing that you do in your life. So do it with all your heart. Take it seriously. And from the Bible, I would get that. Do it as if you're doing it unto God, as if God himself has come and said, do this task, whether it's a menial task like doing the dishes or managing a whole big artist. <laughs> The third thing, um, be kind, be humble, be respectful. You don't have to wait until you know what somebody does before you can respect them. Just because they are human, respect them. That's all there is to it. Because sometimes you don't know where your next help is going to come from. You don't know who your destiny helper, I think that's what they call them, yeah, is helpers. an ETC. Mm -hmm. And number four, being Zimbabwean, is a blessing. There is that thing that makes you Zimbabwean, that makes you special, is a Zimbabwean. Don't let everything else that may be happening around us dim it down for you. It means that you're a survivor and you can survive anything and you can mm. do anything. At least that's what it means for me. Mm. Yeah. Number five, one more. What's that five? <laughs> so number four. Oh, oh, four. Five. <laughs> one more. Five. <laughs> one more. <laughs> one more mm, family mm. uh, love your family with all your heart and do everything that you can for them mm. and grow with them because they are those people that were sent to be dedicated to be around you sometimes there may seem to be misunderstandings and stuff well they are exactly that misunderstandings clear mm. them up talk have uncomfortable conversations mm. and family not only being the blood biological family but any of the other people that you are surrounded with in your spaces wow yeah wow that, that, that's powerful because family your family is the one that you're given and family is family that you choose as well you know which is powerful so it's just some fun questions to close us off okay number one what's your favorite color and why white is the canvas i can paint it into anything oh wow i love that i love that answer <laughs> okay what's your favorite animal and why animal Oh, <laughs> I know, it has to be a lion. The lion is a lion. Really? My mother is a lion. Uh, oh, I right. enjoyed him. Yeah. And then also, uh, they say Mondoro, mm -hmm. like the ancestral guiding spirit uh, comes in the form of a lion. Wow. For almost everybody. But most people. Mm. Yeah. What are you reading right now? Uh, <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> So what I read is, okay, besides Worthy, uh, the, the, the J-Dog, yeah. I don't know, it ended up in my, in my, on my book list, but it's there. I'm reading that. I, I also read what I believe are K-pop, K-novels. <laughs> so there are these uh, applications or, that you find online. Oh, where you get different books used. Oh, yeah, yeah, those ones. Okay. And I read multiple stories at a time, probably yeah. 20. <laughs> I love stories. <laughs> ah, you're a typical creative marketing person, I see. <laughs> so we are packing our bags right now and we're going to the airport. Where are we going? Where are we flying off to? Austria. Austria? Austria. Wow, why Austria? I love the architecture. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Wow, powerful. Uh -huh. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> then we could go on. I mean, I could have said, I mean, I don't think we even touched the iceberg of the things that I wanted us to talk about. So I think we're going to have to have a part two. I think the part two, Natio has to come because he has to, he has to sing and the petty power power. Uh, just for me, <laughs> just <will>. for me. <laughs> uh, but thank you, thank you for your time. Uh -huh. Thank you for your for opening up your heart and your story to us. And I and I hope our viewers have learned and have taken in those points. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Nge Try, for having me. It's oh, an it's honor. I've always I actually wanted to be on this platform. Really? <laughs> Dreams come true. <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, it was, it was absolutely fantastic. I enjoyed every moment with you. 
And I look forward to having you on part two because there's some things I still want to ask <laughs> and, and, and understand. But thank you for your energy. Thank you for everything. And to our viewers, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Please do continue to share, to like. And thank you for being a part of this community. See you next time. Hi, everyone. You've been watching uh, Moments with Nyinge Terai. Please remember to subscribe and to turn on your notifications and to just follow me on all my social media platforms. Thank you.